Um, welcome to Digging Deeper. I am Isba Kazar, so I'm a librarian and archivist at the Tempe Papago Park location. And of course, uh, my co-host tonight is Jennifer Shaver Mary, also a librarian and archivist at the Papago Park Tempe location. We're really excited to have everybody here for this deep dive into our new HS mining records. But we do have to have a few household things taken care of. So the chat box is great. You can introduce yourself and ask questions. Everybody used that great when we asked our opening question. But we would also say, because of the number of people and this being recording, we encourage non-presenters to keep their video off and on uh, their microphone on mute for the presentation, just so everybody not here can have a great recording afterwards. Um, there will be a link sent out, by the way, um, as well as a participation survey, so please look out for that in the coming days from this program. And if you enjoy this program, look out for more on our website with us. On the next slide, we're going to get into, if you don't know us, Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit organization and the state agency established in 1864. We have four locations, sometimes people don't know that. Tempe, Papago Park area, and Tucson uh, are the main ones, but we of course have wonderful historic buildings in Flagstaff and Yuma. And to the next slide, our mission, connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. So we're hosting programs like this and, and inviting people into our museums and other spaces to do that mission. We collect, we preserve, we tell stories of Arizona's past through, as I said, exhibits, libraries and archives, of course, historic sites, educational programs like this, and of course, the Journal of Arizona History, which if you haven't picked up, is a great way to get started on roaming the topics of Arizona history. We do encourage you to stay connected though. You can become a member. We'd love that to see more of you online or in person. Our email list is there. We have social media. And of course, this really, really cool license plate. Um, you will be styling if you get that. Exhibits and programs coming up though. So on air, if you don't know about it, it's Broadcasting and News in Arizona exhibit just opened in our Tempe location. Please come visit us. It's great little swath of history of broadcasting for us. There is also another Zoom event happening. It's Ask the Author series. It's gonna be um, with Dr. Katherine Osborne. That's coming up April 7th. So we do encourage you to come to that. Another great online program. If you wanna learn more about that, please visit our registration site. And then if you are interested in a, a night uh, with us at the museum in Pabago Park. Taste, Toast, and Tales is happening. We're kind of exploring that rise of food and foodies and uh, just the diversity of restaurants uh, by inviting a multitude of eight, I say multitude, but eight of famous chefs and from the Valley and just to have fun, have a little something and have some great tales. So if you're interested, that is a ticketed uh, event that you do have to purchase for, but please feel free to check that out on our website. Moving on, we have da -da -da -da, tonight's guest speaker. Now, now Nemeth, he's uh, over 35 years of experience, actually he said maybe more like 45, um, in mineral exploration and mining, extensive knowledge of Arizona metal and industrial mineral deposits, um, as well as over 50 publications. Uh, I was just amazed to hear this in his bio of just articles of National Mining Bureau articles, numerous unpublished minefield reports, and really just an extensive knowledge with Arizona Department of Mines and Mineral Resources as an employee as connected in relation to just the Arizona mining and mineral resource gathering community. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. And to start, this is our poll moment. I'm gonna have a question come up. Please feel free to, to answer it. We'd really love to know what you, what you think. Uh, here goes nothing. I'm going to launch our question, what is the all time production of gold from Arizona in ounces? 
we are interested to know. Hey, and that's Troy ounces if they don't know, Isabel. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'll give you everybody a couple more minutes to fill that out, or I'm sorry, a minute. Okay, I love it. I'm already getting some results in. This is great, phenomenal. Any more guesses out there? Let me know. Isabel, make sure you read them all off so that Niall can hear what everyone's guessing because I don't oh, think Oh, well, I'm going to share. We yeah. get to share the results. So Perfect. it is anonymous though. So please do not, <laughs> do not feel pressured. Your name's not going to go on this. This isn't a test. It's just a friendly question. All right. I have gotten some pretty good answers. So here goes nothing, guys. I'm going to end the poll and we're going to share some results. All right, the, the winner on the poll was 10.3 million ounces. Niall, would you like to reveal the answer? Yeah, I would, but you were gonna be a little embarrassed. So our <laughs> all time production has been about 16 million ounces. Oh, 60? 16. I one, thought you said, six. sorry? One, six. One, six. six. Oh my gosh, I got the question wrong, guys. Yeah, if you should have had the answer. None of the above is one of the choices. Would have oh been my goodness, that was that was egg that was, on my face. That was face, probably on guys. me not speaking clearly. So I'll I'll take the blame for that. <laughs> well, but it looks like the audience may have gotten pretty darn close because yes, the highest guess was ten point. Absolutely, 8. absolutely. So yeah, a lot of people bad on me for not listening to that sixteen instead of six, which was what I thought I heard. But luckily, Niall has introduced us to. You can make a mistake in mining records, but don't worry, the answer is out there for you to discover. So on that note, why don't you, Niall, tell us a little bit about the history of mining departments and mineral resources here. Thanks for inviting me, Isabel and Jennifer. Glad to be here tonight. Um, I'm gonna take a pretty broad sweep at this. So we're not gonna get down, you know, have time to get down into the nuts and bolts of many of these individual collections. But I also want to paint kind of a, it's a historical, you know, group that holds these records now. So I thought it'd be good to present a historical perspective on, on how time has changed, why we gathered these records, uh, why, why you have the physical copies now, that sort of thing. So at times if I drift off, uh, bear with me. So to kind of start, in the early days, Arizona was visited by a number of what today are very well known mining or economic geologists. We call economic geologists those who study the, uh, the, the metals and the industrial minerals that are economically important to our society. Anyways, those, those folks principally visited the major copper deposits. So places like Morency, the Warren District, which many of you think of as perhaps are no better as Bisbee, uh, the Glow Miami District as some examples. And they published those works. These might've been USGS geologists or people who published in a journal called Economic Geology. But of course, much work, more research, uh, a lot of you know, exploration, mapping, et cetera, has been done over the you know, plus 100 years. And some of that's been published. A lot of that uh, has not been published and, and resides in unpublished records, like a lot of the things that you've obtained from the uh, geological survey recently. Anyways, and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about those records. So next slide. So Mines and Mineral Resources was actually created as just mineral resources by a unanimous vote of the legislature. I don't think that happens very often today that any bills get passed in that manner. Anyways, it was pretty much done at the request of a number of the small mine operating uh, operators and, and the groups like uh, the Arizona Small Mine Operators Association, the Arizona Small Miners and Prospectors uh, groups that, that existed in small mining communities throughout the state. They uh, were largely operating without uh, technical assistance. You know, they didn't have a real mining engineer or a geologist to, to guide their activities. They sometimes got lost. The state also wish to uh, see increased investment and in production, you know, tax base, all those good things, employment product, uh, from increased to mining activity. The other kind of perspective that happened shortly thereafter, and I, I can't 
uh, address the, the, uh, the, the fear or the intensity that might have been anticipating. But it was also a period of uh, World War II and the Korean War. And those are periods of uh, intense demand for minerals because minerals were critical to the uh, US manufacturing to supply the allies in the US for their war needs. And as many people may or may not know, the US and particularly Arizona is rich in uh, natural resources. Anyways, those, uh, those activities and the war efforts in particular focused on copper and other base metals and ferrous alloys like manganese and tungsten. Um, I also kind of, just kind of want to address, so why, why was it important though to, to have a group, you know, why did, why did we need to create and record these mineral resource records and why do we want to create groups to assist mineral development and why would we have created these records? And it's just like a lot of things, we, we build on the shoulders of those who precede us and it's a great benefit to society to not only know where our mineral resources are, but not to have to repeat all the discovery efforts. So if they've been drilled at some point in time and they weren't economic, but uh, technology or demand has changed and they're economic today, uh, there's an efficiency to that. And so that, that was the, the main focus why we, why we do this activity. Um, and it isn't just the state of Arizona that, that uh, did this in terms of government effort. There's been lots of uh, federal government programs over the years, especially uh, with the context of those warriors, for example, to assist exploration and development. Uh, agencies were created like the Defense Mineral Agency. There were particular programs within agencies like the Department of Interior to uh, support uh, exploration. And there used to be another agency called the US Bureau of Mines that did a lot of work both on the resources and on the uh, improving the efficiency and the extraction of the mineral resources. And ADMMR, as, as we were often referred to, we cooperated with those agencies. We we're often a local partner. Um, during some of the war years, we actually approved the rationing of resources. We would actually review applications and, and review those to see who should be approved to get funds, you know, drills, tires, fuel, et cetera, to, to develop, explore and develop their mineral resources. And then a particular one that uh, came along a little later but I think people will uh, perhaps recognize it's important was the Atomic Energy Commission. The Four Corners area was a significant source of uranium uh, for some of the efforts uh, developing the Manhattan Project and so forth. Over the years, that's uh, changed to energy, uh, another energy agency, and today we know it as DOE, but they still maintain a lot of the records that they developed on uranium resources. Um, I just I love this building. Yeah, I'm I just gonna. <laughs> we way, love so that, this building. We want you to tell us more about the building. <laughs> that particular building is on the state fairgrounds and was designed to kind of look like a railroad depot. Uh, I know there's a name for that style of architecture, but I can't tell you that tonight. That building still exists on the state fairgrounds, and the, the you know if we go way back in Arizona, even pre statehood, one of the most popular things at the state fair was that the miners and prospectors would bring in their exhibits. Arizona is, is just wealthy with very delightful, attractive, interesting mineral uh, specimens. And there was kind of competitions to show those. There was a, an older building that had housed the minerals, but at some point they, they moved the uh, minerals to this building. And instead of just being a state fair exhibit, it became a year round exhibit known as the Arizona Mineral Museum. And that got merged into the uh, Arizona Department of Mineral Resources. And then kind of continuing with that theme, if we'd like. Yeah. Many people recognize this building for a period of the 90s to the teens as being the home of the Arizona Mineral Museum. And it was upstairs where the technical staff of the mines division and where all the library of publications and the mine archives resided. Although there are other offices for the agency through the years, I think people might find it interesting. That's where I just recently worked with Isabel, Jennifer, and other staff members and volunteers to uh, box up and move the records from Phoenix to Tucson. But pulling back to what I wanted to mention here. So back a bit again to that historical perspective, why that was needed. Um, just like the economy goes through boom periods and recession periods, 
those greatly affect the production of the raw natural resources that feed the economy. So uh, I'm an exploration geologist, and I can tell you that my perspective on life is that if they don't need the mine, they certainly don't need to explore for new deposits. So exploration geologists are often the, the first to be laid off in, in the, uh, when the busts come. But other things affect that as well. There's been changes in production. There's been changes in our economy that create the demand for new minerals. Uranium is a good example. Until the uh, you know, advent of the demand for fission, you know, nuclear power plants, so forth, there wasn't there wasn't that demand for uranium. So that was a new new a commodity of new interest. There's also been a change in mining through time. There's been a number of these. I'm going to just you know I'm gen making broad sweeping generalizations. So every one of these isn't true. But to give you some perspective, if we were here. You know, 100 years ago, most of the mines would have been of quite high grade, and it would have been relatively small, probably underground mines. Today, due to changes in our mining equipment, today we've got, you know, an, uh, uh, trucks that can haul, you know, a couple hundred tons with just one person driving. So it's a very uh, labor efficient, very large economy of scale operation. So we've kind of changed it from a number of commodities to seeking out what we call bulk tonnage open pit deposits. And so all these things change which mines, which types of deposits are, are of interest. And so the records, uh, you know, and, and what the focus of exploration and mining activity is changes and reflects that. Um, let's see. We might mention that that this is Niall's map. We we did want to yes. a little bit of kudos for him on on his map making skills there. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks guys. You know that was kind of just a a, a, a dumb down match we used for for two very uh, general representations. I also produced there was the lead author on a publication that uh, listed about 400 mines if you include the sand and gravel and aggregate quarries. So you can look up the historical ones of those that the upcoming uh, document repository will tell you about. Um, so anyway, so, so where does one find all that mine data and the associated publications today? And so we've uh, thrown out a URL here. No, go back, sorry. Oh, go back, okay. Yeah, so the URL that's, that's just underneath the heading of this slide. That's a, that's a great landing point to just uh, be introduced to some broad categories. In a few minutes, we're going to point to even some more detailed areas where we'd look for things. So let's let's go there next. Okay. And so the Mines and Mineral Resources, about 2010 or so, was merged into the Geological Survey. And today, our historic and current publications of the survey reside in what we call the Document Repository. And again, you can just see the URL there. You can, uh, there are many, to make it easier to find things, there are many collections there. I think it might be interesting to note that some of the publications of those cooperative federal agencies can be hard to locate. So since they're not copyrighted, we also host some of those. So I think if you look at the bottom of the leftmost column or the far right, top of the far right column, you can see there's some things that address the US Bureau of Mines uh, mineral land assessment reports, their information circulars, the reports of investigations which focus on airs, just the Arizona deposits. So who did all the work to digitize all of these? When, when did you digitize all of these documents? You know, it, it evolved, you know, so in the earliest days, you can imagine uh, the most popular publications, especially if they got out of print, for things you would have prioritized when you had relatively uh, limited scanning and optical character recognition uh, time. But as, as, as the internet caught on and people recognized the value of making these publications and, and you know, maps and other resources widely available or funds either internally or through federal grants and pr programs were available. And so, and so that's how that's occurred. I know that I would often, the other thing that would happen is think if you're in a library, and you get some publication that's out of print and it's getting beat up. You don't want to keep, you know, handing it to the public in your in your visitor room or, or in the lending library. You know, it gets torn and you know pages missing. You quickly decide before this goes out again, that becomes a priority one to to scan and uh, save archive. Exactly. Yeah. Well, these are this is a great collection and that work that we now don't have to do. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, and of course, then the other thing that's probably worth mentioning, uh, I, I hope it's obvious, but of course today, a lot of things, you know, they don't get released in, in paper or in physical materials. They only get published online. And so that's true of a lot of the more recent publications you'll find here. Okay, next. Okay, now we're getting to the to the real meat of my world and also the the subject of, of what uh, tonight's talk is. And and so Isabel and Jennifer, can one of you tell me how many boxes did we uh, end up taking to Tucson? 520, I believe. That seems like a pretty large collection. How does that rank in terms of your other materials that you hold? That's pretty large. I, I, I don't know, Perry and Rachel down in Tucson might have some larger collections since they've I got- I think it might have... only be surpassed by like Isabella Greenway. Oh, all right. Or something, but it's close. Okay, all right, so, nice. so my point is, at least for now, it's a fairly significant uh, acquisition. And as you can see here, or maybe I'll just emphasize, the, the three main types of materials that, that you'll search or want to review. You know, a lot of people may not be interested in the technical information, the geology, mineralogy, and so forth, the tonnage and grade at some mine, but they might enjoy the historical photos. Uh, and then a lot of people might like to read a report and it's only after they read the report that they really might want to tackle looking at the detailed uh, geology maps, the underground mine maps and so forth. And so you might do a map search post, post looking at some of the uh, reports. Um, so what I want to do here, and this is going to be a little boring, so bear with me. This is going to be the longest discussion on any particular slide, but I want to go back to the origins of the mine file. So Mines and Mineral Resources had a, had a core collection that they just called the mine files, or some people might think it was mine folders. And so when the department was in, founded, they encouraged, and, and this is a point where there's very limited knowledge about many of the resources in the state, and, and certainly the, you know, the new staff didn't know all the mines. And so what they did is they encouraged submissions by publishing blank mine owners report forms in industry magazines. They also dispersed those at mine organization meetings of those small mine groups and other professional mine uh, engineers and, and so forth meetings. And just so you know that today in the scanned files and in the physical records, many of those handwritten submissions still exist. Uh, of course, later, most of those were typed and, and you'll find those today as well. And we might just think about the data. You know, it was a varying completeness. You know, some of the blanks on the form, the owners either, either didn't want to or weren't able to respond. And then of course, there's the question of reliability. And I wanna just uh, dwell on that a little bit. But anyway, so we often receive brief, vague descriptions. Um, often mines were held by a family or company for a long time. And then also biased uh, the, the data that was submitted. Some people are secretive, others are more open. So, so you have that going on as well. But I want you to think about the optimism that's, that's uh, displayed and required of a prospector to just you know, get in his truck, get with his Jeep, get his water bottle, whatever he had, and go out for weeks in, in the, you know, the early days of Arizona and explore and try to find a, a, a mine, a mineral commodity that'd be worth mining. You know, it's a very tough thing to do. So you're dealing with an optimistic sort of person. But now I want to, to flip and instead think that we're those people that would have been back in Boston or New York in, in the old days who were the investors. And I think we uh, are in the same situation today. You know, there's, there's still the stock market out there. There's still new discoveries and, and touts of new discoveries being made. And so I want to caution those of you who are investors, it's always wise to do some due diligence. And I think a classic way of, of uh, remembering that is to recall Mark Twain's definition of a gold miner. Many of you have probably heard this uh, either, either corrupted or correctly, but it, this definition of a, a, I'm sorry, of a gold mine, this definition of gold mine was a hole in the ground with a liar standing at the top. So keep, keep that in mind when you're, when you're reading these reports. And I hate to tell you this, but it's true. One of the tasks I used to have was to cooperate with the Arizona Corporation Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission and others. And so we collected what was uh, likely in some cases unreliable information, even in more modern times. And we weren't allowed to like take a big red stamp and, and label it fraud or, or bullshit. 
we just had to drop it into files. And so there is good hard information in those files. There's also unreliable information. And if you are planning to go out and, and invest, or if you're just planning to go out and, and stake a claim on one of those mines, and you're not knowledgeable, certainly consult with uh, an expert. That's um, great advice. <laughs> yeah, we won't, we won't dwell on that, but it's always good to be cautious. Um, so anyway, so these reports, along with early field visits by the department engineers, uh, you know, they're also resulted in many lost mines. And I want to go over that real quickly. And these are not the lost mines like you, like we romantically think of the lost Dutchman with some rich gold treasure that's, you know, was discovered and is not lost or buried. Even when I came to work in Arizona in the 1970s, I was surprised to learn that there were many areas of the state that only had uh, very limited map coverage. They may have had been shown on a uh, one to 250,000 series map, or there may have been some broad road maps available at the land department or department of transportation, but many areas lacked the seven and a half or 15 minute topographic maps that, that we used to use commonly in paper. And today we still use those when we go to the field for you know hiking, recreation, prospecting, et cetera. And so many of these people, and including our own staff, the agency staff at the time, they may have gone out and met in say Salome with a mine owner gotten in their you know, Model T or Model A truck or whatever they had in those days and driven 20 miles north of Salome. And they, and they diligently said they went north you know, 10 miles and they went northeast you know, 10 miles. But there are a number of records which we have never been able to, to pin down to just you know, one absolute certain site. So, and, I, and we've turned those over nicely identified for the Historical Society folks so they can just recognize these are lost they're, they're real, but don't know where they are. Somebody said they existed and we just never, it was yeah. just never absolutely documented. You can't pin it down to one spot on the ground. Okay. Yep. The other significant part of the early documents, by the way, they they're consist of earlier generation consultant reports, mining company reports and prospectuses. Um, however, through time, the, the, the amount of data and the nature of the data changed. We, it became increasingly larger. And, and generally of much higher technical quality and contain many more descriptions of the mineralogy of the deposits, the geology of the deposits, might've been maps of the underground workings, uh, assays, uh, drill logs, and so forth. So as time went by, more effort was put into, you know, in the volume of this data group, more time was put into organizing the information. Uh, along with that, society developed you can still stay back in that other page. Back on the line. Okay. Yep. This is the long, boring part. We're halfway through it, guys. Hold on. Anyways, it's not so boring. I, I, I swear. It's actually intriguing. Okay. <laughs> so, we, so, you know, as a society, as, as an industry, we got a better understanding of the geology. We, we started, you know, making more uh, groupings and generalizations about things, started recognizing different deposit model types. For example, Arizona is well known for its porphyry copper deposits, but we also have copper occurring in places like Jerome with volcanogenic massive sulfides. Uh, recently down in the Southern Arizona, we've had a big zinc discovery, world-class, that's carbonate replacements. And so, you know, we, we started categorizing the information in different ways, making different groupings, uh, putting them instead of just in the old geographic mining district, we started putting them into metallic mineral districts. Uh, so as this data became voluminous and complex and so forth, fortunately, another thing happened. Society developed computers. And so we had more ways to start generating, you know, databases, organizing and retrieving this information. And of course, one reason why the, the physical records are becoming less important to some of us is the benefit of the access and availability of the records by, as we were just discussing the scanning uh, through the internet. I want to mention that during the same period, we also saw, and remember we talked about the cooperation and coordination between federal and state agencies. Well, everybody was kind of creating their own databases. And today, as, as we've kind of merged all these records, uh, where you want to go look for things if you want to start, might be the US Geological Surveys, MRDS, the Mineral Resource Data System. One of the large components from Arizona that would have fed into that was a uh, data set that we developed with the US Bureau of Mines called MILS, M-I-L-S, the Mineral Industry Location System. You can see that reference towards the bottom of this slide. 
And in particular, we uh, developed this as a, uh, continued developing it as the ASMILs, the Arizona Mineral Street Location System. Yeah, I just saw that I had poor internet connectivity for the while. Are you guys with me? Hmm? Yep, I can still hear you. Good. Sorry about that. I live at the end of the end of the canyon, so I get poor service sometimes. Anyways, the other thing I want to mention here, and I'll mention it, and when we talk about one of the, the upcoming collections, the other thing you have to remember about things that are on the internet. So we scanned the material that was uh, copyrighted and not copyrighted. But all the records you see on the internet, unless we were able to get permission, and we didn't get that very often, we had to either uh, redact or make sure we had uh, never even posted in the same PDFs, et cetera, uh, copyrighted materials or materials that someone viewed as uh, not, not for public disbursement. And so one of the advantages that you'll have when you go use these materials in the archives of the Historical Society is that you'll have all the material at your disposal, not the limited uh, material that you see in the digital files. In some so cases, unredacted. in some cases, we've we put gray boxes when there were just parts of a page that were something that was uh, copyrighted. That was an old old clipping out of a magazine article or something. But in other cases, there may be you know tens to hundreds of pages of material that are just missing, and you have no indication of that. Okay, next slide. And so these, these collections uh, get pretty voluminous and to you know, filter down or, or to look at you know, a, per, a particular period of time or a particular aspect of the investigation of a property might be beneficial to uh, sort by these collections. And, you know, and why, why is that? So why so many collections? So in the old days, you know, often I think I mentioned a, a mine and a mining company might have been synonymous. But, but as we get to the more modern era, people tend to, you know, merge companies, properties tend to be, you know, sold off as, as not to the style of management and so forth. The other thing that happened is we got more sophisticated in terms of the investigations of the properties. Um, you've got people that are, are uh, experts. They might be a ge geophysicist, like someone we'll talk about in a few minutes, Walt Heinrichs. You might have somebody who's more focused on, uh, you know, some other aspect of geology or a particular commodity. And so they developed their own data set. And with these data sets getting so large, it was also, uh, they're often already organized. It, it didn't pay just to, you know, keep trying to jam a larger and larger sh uh, shoebox, not a shoebox, but now, uh, you know, several filing cabinets into the, uh, the existing form of the collections. Instead, better to preserve those as records themselves, because if someone liked the work that someone did in one area, they may enjoy looking at their, their, you know, the rest of the properties they explored and what they investigated or what they thought of those. Yeah, you know, and the other part of that, I think I mentioned it, um, not only did people tend to focus say on copper deposits or they may have been a uranium expert, but also some of the projects we mentioned, they, they started focusing on uh, lower grade, but bulk tonnage, very large deposits. And so, Sometimes the data sets grew very large. The, the Anderson mine listed here is one of those. One of the first properties I ran across where literally there were thousands of shallow drill holes rather than your typical maybe tens or hundreds of drill holes. And you know, and the associated radiometric logs and everything just became you know, massive data sets unto themselves. The other reason there are so many collections, and this is where I'm gonna kind of toot my own horn a bit. So initially, one of the things we did in, in addition to the data that we uh, received, we also went out and did field investigations. That part of that assistance of observing people's and, and companies' properties and giving that operating advice. But being the state of Arizona, our budget uh, never really grew with the times. In fact, it shrunk. And so I had, uh, as I had less field funds, travel funds and so forth, assay, data, uh, assay funds available, and I saw the, the maturing of the industry, the maturing of a lot of individuals, uh, of companies building a wealth of data. I decided it might be better to preserve existing data. And especially, you know, with the littler companies, you did that through periods of those bus periods where they may have gone out of business or changed their focus. And then, uh, unfortunately, I also acquired a, a bit of a, a nickname uh, from some of my colleagues for my activities. And they called me the uh, Grim Reaper. 
uh, and I didn't just harvest this from, from widows of these uh, former geologists, uh, deceased geologists or, or mining engineers. But what I tried to do is, is start uh, courting them and planning for the preservation of their, their data when they retired. And so a lot of these are collections that I, I particularly myself solicited and acquired for the agency. Okay, these, are, these are great collections. And I just want to mention that we, um, the collections as we took them, many of them are exactly as you see on these lists here. We have the ADMMR collection, the Heinrich collection for Walter, one for Grover, on down. And so showing you here, this is where you're going to find the specific information that Niall's talking about is going to be listed pretty much exactly like it is on this on this website. We have these collections labeled this way and they're in our collection as these names. So I think that's kind of important to point out that if you're looking for something he mentions here, this is, you can check here first to know how to find them. I think we'd have to change your name uh, to, not to Grim Reaper, I would, I would call it like preserver. So yeah. something like that. <laughs> I mean, there are getting records. Well, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was done, it was done in good, good. Uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> Um, I guess briefly, I want to comment here that in addition to the to the files, you know, that were organized by the mine data, also things that the historical society has obtained is they've gotten uh, collections of historic company annual reports and 10Ks, which are very difficult to find. And if you're a historian or if you're trying to find some obscure mining property, those are those are great places to read about the reporting of the activity. And then there were associated materials, of course. You know, there were this was an activity of a people. So we had cards and other information on the owners, on the operators of industry service providers, and they've acquired all those historical records. Similarly, we also wrote reports, not just on mines, but we also wrote about exploration trends, uh, associate activities, uh, collated and put out production statistics, uh, commented on changes in technology as, as we've gone from, you know, just being sulfide only interested to, to leaching and having solvent extraction in, uh, technology for the copper industry, for example. So, so they, they've gotten a lot of uh, affiliated materials as well that reflect ongoing activities uh, historically in, this, in Arizona. One of the other uh, areas I think that's highlighted here, online, you only see fairly low resolution copies of the, to save space at the time on servers, for the uh, black and white collection. And it's worth noting that uh, there's a smaller but still pretty interesting collection of uh, color slides that are largely uh, taken by me because we had no money for film. I would just want to take the pictures like I was on vacation. I'd take the pictures and donate all the slides to the agency. So good stuff there. Photochrome, so they shouldn't be uh, fading yet, largely. Okay, next. Oh, this is just a fun one for me to tell you about a couple of things. Go back to that collaboration with the US Bureau of Mines. There was a period where you know there were regional offices, often for the Western region here, the office was Denver. But when people were doing a lot of field work, they needed a place to hang out, and write up the reports and so forth. And they did that in, in Phoenix at our offices. And so that as, as the reports went to Denver, you know, we could still understand why you might want to get a copy or go to Denver and look at those reports in the old days. We had these index cards, which I double photographed and then scanned. They're online, they're quite interesting. But back to why you want to go look at the original materials. Many of the comments, not on the one shown here, but on many of these, there are redacted areas of the uh, index cards. Those were uh, typically removing uh, sensitive comments or perhaps comments that a project was uneconomic because times change, economics change, technology changes. Those comments aren't necessarily apropos today. But what's neat is you might wanna know why or what they actually said. Well, in the old days, they had these things called typewriters. And even though they're redacted with a Sharpie, today, often you can just, in the light, take that card, rotate it, and you'll see the imprint to the typewriter and you can read the comments can't do it on the scans. Okay, next. So just to give an example uh, or, or to, to call out how significant the work is for some of these collections. 
Paul Heinrichs was a pioneering geophysicist and he's largely uh, credited with the discovery of one of the major mines south of T Tucson, known as the, the Pima Mine. Uh, although today that's, that's collectively known as the Mission Mine, they're operated by ASARCO. Um, one of the other things that's worth noting, a lot, although there's geology and other exploration data in his collection that's heavy to, on geophysics, I had a number of geophysicists on that one, but I've had a number of geophysicists tell me that these collections of raw data are quite valuable and should be reprocessed today and can serve us well. Okay, next. Just a quick story here on, on uh, maybe just sometimes it takes interesting coincidences that, that has resulted in these collections of, of exploration mine data. And so there was a period in the late 1970s where the United States went off the gold standard and they allowed the price of gold to float to the world market. And so many, many, many properties that have been depressed since World War II after the Gold Closure Act and hadn't been operated on were probably worthy of investigation. And so there's, there's always a universal appeal of gold. There was a coal miner in England by the name of Tony Budge, Anthony Budge, who decided that, it, that he'd like to be in the Western United States and operate some gold mines. And so he didn't know how to go about that, but an easy way to reach folks was he published an ad in the Wall Street Journal expressing his interest. It happened that there was a semi-retired geologist who had finished up his career, uh, done a lot of work in Nevada for a company called Superior Oil, named Ben Dickerson, who one day was, was reading that ad, picked up the phone, called England, and got acquainted and became the consultant for Tony Budge. The result of their collaboration was new gold production at two famous Arizona mines. One, the Vulture, the largest gold mine in Maricopa County, and the other was one of the VMS deposits that had a uh, area in its mine known as the Gold Stope, and that was the UVX or United Verde Extension uh, in Jerome, one of the ones you see when you're uh, at the Douglas Mansion. Okay, next. Uh, wait, I just asked that this slide be included to kind of note that the some of the activities of these collections, so the Cobal Caresses collection, uh, George Cobal Caresses did a number of investigations and sought a number of submittals on mining properties so that he could have feed for his smelter, which was located at Humboldt. If you don't know where Humboldt is, it's, it's uh, between I-17 and Prescott about midway. And if you'd look off on the north side of, of Highway 69, you used to see the smelter we see in this photo. And I think it's kind of sad to note that many of these sites are now fading away, some only recently. So it was just earlier this year where the smelter remains that you see in this photograph were taken down. So with that, I, I think we can turn it back over to the historical site. Thanks for your attention. All right. I did add, I snuck this last slide in for you to comment on, Niall, on the unfinished collections. You did mention uh, a lot of these published materials that you weren't able to, due to copyright, able to put up online. So there's several boxes, what were labeled unfinished collections. Um, and in there, you had mentioned that there we could find some of these publications, the magazines, the journals, um, and some of these other things. So not, it's not, all, not only in those, in, in the in other back, ones goes back to those physical files that you guys possess many times, yes. you know, to make it easier to find these things, or you know, people would instead of throwing the magazine away, they'd tear out the pages they wanted to reference in the and future and they'd drop in them over. in those physical files. But Wonderful. we weren't able. Anything post 1926 is protected by copyright laws. And right. if you don't have the permission of the publisher or the author or the owner of those copyrights you're not allowed to re-host that material on the internet right. or, or, or otherwise reproduce it and distribute it. And so, yeah, those physical files are just rich in, and because if, give an example, if there was some big change at one of the mines, and that's why we listed Sam and Well here, there's a period where that mine, instead of just being an underground mine, became a in situ leach and they mined an oxide portion out of the uh, collapse zone. And, and EMJ did a, a like a five page story full of wonderful color photographs on the Salmon Well mine. Well, there's no reason for us to write up or comment much on that. We just dropped the article in the mine file. 
but it's not online. You got to go to the historical yeah. site if you want to find that reference. And but you know, like we were exactly. talking, <laughs> like we were talking about just before the um, presentation. You know, you can't even find Pater Magazine images online. You can't. It's not no there. So public. yeah, God, it was published for like forty years out of Bisbee. Great magazine on the copper industry. So there's some of those in there. So that's going to be good to look at. And one of the other things we kind of wanted to bring up is that not only do we have this massive collection now um, in both of our Tempe and our Tucson locations, we do have some other great mining collections that sort of do tie into this larger collection. Um, up here in Tempe, we have the Mason Coggin mining collection. Um, and uh, Niall, you were telling us some stories about Coggin and there's it ties into this new collection because he was a photographer and we've got a lot of his collection his photography collection now with this new um intake and as you can see on the screen we pulled one out of there and some great 70s imagery <laughs> yeah and it's also worth noting that uh, mason coggin was a one-time director of mines and mineral resources so he that's right that's right so and that's a collection we've had in tempe for quite a long time um and it's a uh, pretty big uh collection to go through as well so if you're looking for anything that he's done it's something that we already have um, another collection that we already have is the oral mining collection um and this was lewis oral um and it's mostly at tracing the history of his companies and some of his journal articles and writings so it's not heavy on um it, it's pretty similar to a lot of these other collections talking about the minerals themselves um and then a little bit of history so that's up here in our tempe location as well um down in tucson we have a really excellent collection from william blake and uh his uh he was uh, shoot, I just spaced on his profession, but he was a, he was a professor at the University of Arizona, um, but he also traveled extensively, and you can see a couple examples of his little drawings out of his diaries. Um, he annotated quite a bit of the work that he's noting in his diary, so you might just have you know, saw XYZ mine today, but then he might draw the inside of the mine or a slice of the, the mineral that he was looking at, um, or he might draw a picture of the mountains like you see here. His handwriting is terrible, so when you're going through it, you really have to, you'll get used to it if you read a lot of his diaries, but um, we had a, a volunteer that went through a lot of these and created a, a much better finding aid that we are, we still need to put up, but, um, and that annotated more of what was in this collection, but uh, it's really excellent. And it's one of those ones that we talk about that eventually we're not gonna be able to let the public see anymore because it's a hundred years old already. So um, that's, a, that's a really fun collection that I like seeing. Um, and then our Tucson location actually has a ton of small, what we would call collections, but they may just be one box or a couple of folders from mines all over. I mean, um, this is just a very small slice of what we have in our two locations of just small collections of mining. So if you have an interest in mining, please give us a call and see what we have. Um, all of these are on our, our catalog, so you can search through our catalog for these sorts, sorts of terms um, that Niall was talking about, or the name of the mine, um, or the name of the, the person that was in charge of the mine, uh, just try all of those searches in our catalog. And it, if all else fails, give us a call and let us know what it is that you're looking for. And we might have something because we do have pretty, pretty extensive mining collections that I don't think are utilized enough. So this is the great moment where the audience via the chat can ask any questions and we will try to answer them. Um, if not, we will just have a great conversation as Jen and myself ask Niall questions that we've been um, interested in knowing. But uh, if you do have a question, you're thinking about one, please feel free to put it in the chat. We've got um, a few minutes here left at the program uh, to put a few uh, questions to Niall. But I know that Jen had a, had a few that she was uh, wanting to ask now. So if you want to start us off, 
Jen. Right. So one uh, item, so we were talking about the smelter in Dewey Humboldt um, that recently was torn down. Um, what can you tell us about the one in Superior uh, Resolution Copper that was torn down in 2018? What was the significance there? The Was it the magma smelter, I think? I was reading a couple articles on that. Yeah, you know, the, the last company that operated the uh, salmon well and, and the magma mine prior to the development of Resolution Copper, uh, both uh, had smelters at their sites. They're both gone. One of the things that's uh, I think the community kind of wanted to keep the smelter at Superior. It was just such a landmark historical identification of the community. But like with many sites, uh, the, the stacks themselves become unstable. And of course, often there's environmental concerns and it's you know better to take care of those earlier than later. Okay, yeah, I saw that they were talking about having the department of um, the ADEC come out and check at check it out because of environmental concerns. So that makes sense. Yeah, um, D commonly called DEQ in my world. Yeah. <laughs> um, environmental quality. E you. Yeah, quality. That was the one I was couldn't think of. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you is um, you had mentioned in some of our talks before this William Epler, and then I found some more information about him online. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about him a little bit and his contributions. You know, I, I met Bill and I know the gentleman who was the publisher of Paydirt afterwards, but I, I can't add much other than that. Okay. It was for most of the publication's existence, it focused entirely on the Arizona copper, almost exclusively on the Arizona copper industry, an attempt to uh, uh, probably say circa 2000 to broaden the audience and, and to keep the publication economically viable. They started to put out editions that focused uh, more broadly you know, like up in Nevada and some of the gold activity. By the way, the, the Arizona, uh, there was an Arizona edition, but it often included a lot of the copper mines in the southwestern part of New Mexico. Um, but, you know, it, it covered uh, broader issues, labor, uh, some of the, if you want some history on Phelps Dodge, it had tons of articles talking about the activities at the Phelps Dodge mines, in addition to what they saw reported in the, you know, annual reports or 10Ks or quarterly releases. They, they knew people at the various mines that would get interviews. So it was a great source of information. Okay. Um, I, I think um, if we can offer um, Kay Sandox to, to ask his question live, because I'm, I'm just uh, not quite understanding it. So please go ahead and, and do that. Okay. I seem to, I know that the uh, governor closed the uh, store downtown at the state office complex. But didn't he also close a collection of uh, minerals or uh, not the museum, the minerals or uh, papers or something that was either uh, in the state building or at the university? We should, we should give credit where it's due. It was under the Brewer administration that the uh, museum was transferred and has spun off to whatever it is today, but you know, in, in a shell, not in an active existence. Um, there was a mineral uh, uh, display museum. It's part of the geology uh, department over at AS, uh, ASU in Tempe. That's disappeared. Is that what you're referencing? No, and oh. not, the, uh, not the state museum downtown. Uh, which was uh, closed to be a centennial or something. And as far as right, I that know- That was the, the building you saw, 15th Avenue in Washington. And that's one that, that the University of Arizona is attempting to reopen today as a natural resource museum. The, uh, the mineral collection that was at Flandreau is now in the uh, courthouse downtown, or at least part of it. And there's some of it still at Flandreau, which is sort of now a general science museum downstairs and planetarium upstairs. But I thought that there was a, uh, not tree rings either, a lab or something that uh, either moved to the university and then was, uh, all the space was taken away or was uh, closed because whoever it was didn't appreciate its importance. Mm. I, I suspect the answer lies in the, in the transmogrification of it was the Arizona Mining and Mineral Museum to the U of A, somewhere, somewhere along the various plans that have been proposed. 
Yeah, Kelly from the chat is saying, is this the flag FLAGG collection that you're? Don't know. A lot of the flag, the flag collection still exists. Parts of that are on display down at the new, I forget the new name, it's Elfie's part of the word for the new museum in Tucson. And some of that is uh, still available for the, if it reopens or when it reopens, the museum in uh, Phoenix. Okay, may maybe that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a private. That's Are you private... talking about the Arizona Geological Survey that used to be located on Congress in downtown Tucson and was transferred to the U of A and is now in the U of A offices? Yes, I know that was the store I said that was closed. There was also something on 6th and 9th or someplace where they're doing road work now, but that might have moved to someplace else sometime farther back. The, the Geological Survey exists today in the old Arid Land Studies Building uh, on the University of Arizona campus. Hmm. Which building? It, it was formerly known as the Arid Land Studies Building. I don't have the address in front of me, but if you go to the Arizona Geological Survey's homepage, hit about, You'll, you'll see the location, address, oh, map, all that good stuff. Okay. Well, th th thank you for piquing our curiosity. We'll have to continue uh, digging into that. But I, I do have another question from the audience, if we can, um, with the time we have. How much material on uranium mines is included in these state collections, not the federal records per se, but the state um, resources? You know, not, not as much as you might imagine. Being a sovereign nation, we didn't actively investigate the uranium mines as mines and mineral resources. However, as part of the efforts of the Atomic Energy Commission and uh, other agencies post then, certainly there was quite an archive of publications. Uh, people aren't familiar from starting with uh, IRDA and then ending up with uh, Department of Energy, DOE, there was a nationwide investigation of uranium resources called NURI, N-U-R-E, the National Uranium Resource Evaluation Program. And that is just a wonderful archive. So the best, the best place online to dig deeply into that nationwide is the University of North Texas Library. Hmm. They have the most extensive, complete uh, records. Wonderful. Uh, we, we also have another question. Um, if you have any knowledge on William Cor uh, Cornell Green and the Kanea Copper Mo Company, if you have any thoughts about uh, where to learn about more about that, or if you have any, any stories that, that stick in your mind from those. Uh, no, you know, I, I don't really. That's before my time. My there's, thoughts, there's but we, I'm sure there's a wealth of information on him and some of the libraries in Tucson. And right, and I, I yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, but I do believe we have um, quite a few Kanea Copper Company, at least, at least if not the, their records, um, mentions of them in our mining materials, as well as some photos of Kanea. Um, so that could be- Yeah, definitely, um, and definitely in Tucson, yeah. Yeah. And then I, I know somebody is just interested in us repeating the or posting in the chat, if you could grab it for us, Jen, the URL that begins with mine data. And I, I think as Niall was stressing there, the, the place to go first might be the digital platforms to start that search to get um, your feet One. wet with uh, the collection. Yeah, that's, that's this good. one right here. The No, go back one. No, this back one? to the okay. previous slide, top of the previous. Nope. Is, nope. The one that you had on the screen before that. Oh. So it's the surveys URL slash mine data. You know what? We can always uh, include that Just in our Go, go our forward email. about it. There, right, um, stop right there. Right there. <laughs> there mine it data. is. Mine data. On the screen. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so the mine data dot azgs dot arizona dot edu. And everybody that's on this call is going to get a copy of this presentation. So you'll have it to watch again, and it will also be on our YouTube channel. So you can copy that down. And um, I'll make a note that when we send out the email, we'll put some of these links in the email, the body of the email itself. So you don't have to go back and search for them. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And also, if, you go to the, if you go to the homepage of the geological survey and just scroll down, there's a highlight of the mine data portal. 
description, you can click on the link right there from the home page. And you've got these other options too. You've got a map search, a photo search, and some other things on that page too, um, which is kind of helpful. Uh, now, I did have one last question. Um, we talked about the Mills maps a little bit. Um, can you talk about the map collection that we got and a little bit of, of that importance, um, those physical maps that we grabbed at the end that are uh, countywide? Those are just index maps to the as mills records. So if people aren't good at township and range or they don't know how to, you know, do a latitude longitude or those sorts of things, but they can drag their finger across paper maps on highways and Jeep trails. Those would be a great way for people to get to a index number, which then would be let you know the name of the mine, the location of the mine, the commodities, and so forth. And we've got those databases too that you created with. Yeah, I didn't dwell on it much, but we've handed off, you know, the indexes, the databases, the search tools to, to go with these collections. Yes, thank you. Great. Well, I uh, I think we've covered everybody's uh, questions that came in through the chat. Um, hopefully, we've got everybody thinking about what their um, next project is. But we're going to give you guys a lot of lead time because, as we mentioned, there is 500 plus boxes. Um, they were moved. Um, but we might need a little bit, we will need a little bit of time before we uh, kind of release them to access. So we're saying plan your trips around summer uh, as those re records being available and um, ready. So as as a, we've mentioned, start on the digital, get your ideas uh, started on what might be best to come in and see. Uh, and then you can help us and we can help you uh, as the year rolls on to continue the access of this great collection or collections of records. Yeah, that, that was really good advice, Isabel. Start on those digital collections and come on in and, and see the physical things. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and Niall, we really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. I know you're busier now that you're retired than you were when you were working. So thank you for spending some time with us and going over these collections with everyone so that we can understand what we've got better. Okay, my pleasure. Absolutely. So with that, I think I'm going to wish everybody a wonderful rest of their evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's just been a pleasure and uh, we hope to see you at one of our other programs in the future. Thank you. And just as a side note, um, in the email that we send out, we'll make sure we've got our reference email address, um, AHS reference at AZG, AZHS, I've got the AZGS in my head, AZHS.gov. And we'll make sure that's in the email. So if you have questions, you can shoot us an email or give us a call and let us know what you're looking for and we'll see if we can find it for you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye.